Everybody turn to page 87 in your book, please. And oh, let's see. I'm trying to think who hasn't prayed for us. Nick, would you pray for us today, please? Yeah. Thank you very much. Bow your heads, please. Dear Lord, I pray that we all have a good day. I pray even that Mrs. Brady's can teach us the knowledge that we need help to learn in this lesson. And I pray that everyone here that is um, coming here can uh, be here safely. And I pray that if anyone's sick, they can just heal um, so that they can come to heed. And I pray that you have a good rest of the day. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Okay, so we are on chapter six, and I am going to use my old book. So if I say the wrong number, I'll try to correct it. That, that, these three books that we've been working in came from this one book, and the trick is, this book's old because I beat it to death. I've used it and used it and used it, but it's got all my notes in it. And rather than redoing all my notes this week because I didn't have time, I decided I'm just going to use this book and we'll go back and forth, okay? So the verbiage is the same. Some of the pictures are slightly different, so that's why I've got your book sitting right here so I can go back and forth. God bless you. Plus, Spencer's going to help me to make sure I stay on track, okay? Um, but, so we're on submarine meadows. Now, I know on the other coast... One student actually, uh, when I, we said last week that we were gonna be on submarine meadows this week, he goes, oh, I hate seagrass. And you guys probably haven't had a lot of experience with seagrass, but he hated seagrass because I said, why do you hate seagrass? And he says, well, because when you step in it, you sink. I go, but it's not like the yard. It's not made for you walking on it. And he's like, oh, you know. <laughs> so when you actually know something about the seagrass, it's very cool because that's where the nursery is for a lot of the animals that we go fishing for, the crabs and the shrimp and the fish and all that. And, and there's sea urchins in it, you know, and there's, oh, yeah, the seagrass is just full of life. The problem is most people never look at it. If you ever have a chance to snorkel, I mean, most people, when you snorkel, you go right to the coral reefs because they're so colorful and, and all that. But if you have a chance to snorkel in the seagrass, you'll be really surprised at all the stuff you see. And we're going to go over some of it today. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in the seagrass. And you just don't think about it because we just see grass. And so we don't think too much about it. Um, and I don't have a picture for this. So go ahead. And in the previous chapter, <coughs> we had that map that showed where everything is on page 69. Uh, and it's the map on the bottom of the page on page 69. So it's uh, figure 5.2. Everybody see it? Okay. <clears throat> I want you to notice that the seagrass beds aren't on the east coast particularly. They are on the west coast of Florida. And so where you see them is up along the Big Bend area. And we're told in the book that that area is... 750,000 acres. I don't even know what I can equate that to so that you guys can get a picture of how big that is. But well, look at it compared to the state of Florida. It's pretty big. It's a pretty big area, isn't it? And then the one uh, near the southwest coast of Florida, you see that one down there? That one is over a million and a quarter. So 1,250,000 acres of underwater meadow which if that was for horses and you got to throw your horses out on that, that'd be like, oh, Snoopy dance, you know, that'd be great. And so this is a lot of, of underwater meadows that we have here in Florida. And it's a very important community to the ecosystem. Um, so go ahead and, and flip back over to page 87 for me, please. And we're looking at seagrasses. And it tells us here that seagrasses are not true grasses, but they are true plants. They are true flowering plants. And I don't know if you think about that, but they actually have flowers on them. And the reason that plants have flowers is to make fruit and that have seeds in them so that the seeds can produce other plants. Flowers are actually part of the reproductive system of a plant to make seeds to make new plants. And think about it, when you eat fruit, there are seeds in the fruit, unless of course you're getting seedless grapes or something like that because we don't like chewing on the seeds. But you know what I'm saying, most fruit has seeds in it because the purpose of the fruit is actually to make the seeds so that there can be new plants. So these are like land plants in that they have flowers. And I don't know about you, I have never seen a flower on the seagrass beds because I 
guess I haven't been looking for the flowers. I'm a critter person and I tend to look for the critters. So, um, but I wanted to show you, this is what it looks like. These are the flowers. And can anybody tell me which of the four types of grasses that you read about, which one is this? This one is, yeah, take a look. See if you can tell me which type of grass. This is, this is a specific broad-leafed grass. Which one? Turtle grass, very good. The turtle grass has the broad leaf to it. And so these are flowers on turtle grass. And I, this is not in your book. I got this when I was looking for pictures on the internet, but I thought it was really cool that these little crustaceans, crustaceans being things like shrimp and crab and lobster, those are all crustaceans, okay? These tiny crustaceans, actually it says here, serve as sea bees. They take care of pollinating the flowers of the sea grasses. Also, the pollen is just released into the water, just like some flowers, the pollen is carried by the wind, but other flowers, bees actually carry the pollen from one flower to the other, and so do hummingbirds, and certain beetles help. There's certain, well, butterflies do it. So all those things, even bats are pollinators, which, you know, you might not think of it, but that's very helpful to us, because without pollinators, then you don't have seeds, and then you don't have fruit, and then you don't have anything to eat, and you don't have new plants. So they're very, very important. So these little critters are considered the <laughs> sea bees. They're helping with the pollination. The other thing I thought of is if you have an al allergic reaction to pollen, to say you have hay fever, and you're snorkeling when these sea grasses are pollinating, I can't help wondering if you might not get a reaction. But you're not breathing it per se, but you're in it, your skin's in it. So I, I haven't been able to find out information on that. But anyway, they do pollinate and these little critters actually help with the pollination process. Now we're also told that because these are true plants, not grasses, but plants, um, that they have roots, that they attach into the sediment in, they have rhizome. A rhizome is a horizontal, stem. Now I know that everybody here at some point in time has tried to pull a piece of grass up out of your yard where it didn't belong, maybe across the sidewalk or something, and you notice that when the grass came up it went Did you notice that? Okay, that's because the grass has a rhizome. It has this horizontal stem that the grass grows off of and that the roots grow out of, and that's why it pops up like that, okay? And so sea grasses actually have that same kind of structure that goes down into the sand that the sea grass is in and helps it to hold there. Now, Let's go ahead and turn to the next page, and it shows you the four seagrasses. The seagrass beds are as diverse as any other underwater ecosystem, even coral reefs, believe it or not. Um, they have a bunch of small invertebrates, and to them, invertebrates being things that don't have backbones. Okay, so shrimp and crabs and sea urchins and uh, sea slugs and sea squirts and all those guys. Uh, it says to them, the blades in this part would be like a forest. To the carnivorous fish, it's a jungle where they can hunt prey. To sea turtles and manatees, it's a big pasture like it would be for my horses if it was above ground or to a cow. And for tiny travelers, it's safe passage. And that always makes me think, and you've probably never seen the movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But um, have you ever seen that movie, oh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? It, it, that line always makes me think of that movie. And in case you haven't seen that movie, it's where the guy by accident shrinks his kids to be like so tiny. And they, then he throws them out in the trash not knowing. And then they have to make it back through the backyard. And so everything's huge. And it's like going through a jungle, isn't it? So that part always makes me think of that. Because it's like the seagrass for little tiny critters is like going through a jungle. So it can protect them, actually, because they can hide. But it also can be dangerous in, in case something's there that might eat them. So that's pretty cool when you think about it. Oh, and if just go back to the previous page for just a minute. Do you guys see the little fish on 87? That is a, um, there's a little picture of a little fish on the right hand side bottom and it's a pipe fish and it says that they live offshore in Florida's Big Bend. Um, they look kind of like a needlefish, don't they? Is but the same as a um, trumpet fish? No, uh, it's probably not a needlefish. It's probably um, very similar and it might even be within the same kind, but it's like the difference between a Chihuahua and a Jack Russell Terrier. They're both dogs, right? Uh, but there's slight differences. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's slight differences, slight difference in size, slight difference to them, and you can interbreed them and they can have puppies together, so you might be able to breed a pipe fish with a needlefish, but they're slightly different. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Try to bring it to something we can relate to. I always go to dogs. Dogs or horses, you know, my brain just goes there right away. So. 
What did you say, Spencer? Are pipefish the same as needlefish? No, what I'm saying is they're probably within kind. I mean, um, sorry, um, trumpetfish. I'm not sure, uh, but pro possibly within kind. They're very similar, aren't they? And so, now what an evolutionist would say, because this is going to come up today, what an evolutionist would say is they're related. And the reason they would say they're related is scientifically they see similarities between the two. But that does not mean they're related, because when they say related, they mean they evolved one from another. Okay? Uh, they might be related, and as a creationist, if I say they're related, that means they came from the original same kind, and we see variation within that kind. Back to the dogs again, just like within the dog kind, there was an original dog kind, and out of those dogs we see everything from wolves, jackals, hyenas, coyotes, down to our domestic dogs. So they're all within kind, and in that way they're related. They're not buffalo, so the trumpet fish and the needle fish and the pipe fish definitely aren't puffer fish right, or sharks, you know, so, so they may be related, could be, but when an evolutionist says related, they're actually trying to tell you that they came from the same evolutionary line, but really as, as scientists we can look at it and say when they say they're related, there's some similarity that that's why they're saying they're related. It doesn't mean they're related. It could be a similar design feature. We're going to see another example of that in here that we're going to go over. So it's worth talking about. Okay, the first kind of grass that's mentioned in your picture on the top left on page uh, 88 is shoal weed. And the book tells us that shoal weed is actually the one that grows closest to the shore and closest to the river's mouths because shoal weed can tolerate um, being out of the water completely at low tide. It won't die. If the real super low tide, it won't die. So that's good. And it can handle a lot of fresh water. So it doesn't have to be in just totally salt water. It can handle a certain amount of fresh water. So that's why you see it right at the edge. You see it where the tide may go down low enough that the turtle grass would die. You may see it near the river flowing in so that the salinity, and remember salinity is referring to the salt levels in the water. The salinity is low because you have so much fresh water coming in. Well, the shoal grass, excuse me, shoal weed can handle it. So notice it's a very skinny, uh, a skinny little stalk on it. And I don't know if you can, can you guys see the algae on the shoal weed here? It's actually coated in algae, this particular shoal weed. We're going to talk about this white sand too and where it comes from in this class. I wanted you to see that the shoal weed does have the rhizome and so it's got the blade and then it's got the rhizome and then it's got the um, grass, the roots coming out of it that attach it. And shoal weed, it tells us, is very important because it will put those roots down and it allows the sediments to build up and then other life can come in there and live in there. Um, so now you tell me, what kind of grass is this again? Turtle. turtle grass. It's the only one that's got a broad leaf, really, isn't it, that's long and thin with a broad leaf. This is turtle grass. <clears throat> this particular little ball is on a stalk. I don't know if you can see it very well. And that's a type of algae, actually, from what I understand. Okay, um, yeah, and, and there's some algae in here, too. And your book actually talks about microalgae would be phytoplankton. But macroalgae, macro meaning we can see it with the naked eye, you and I would call it seaweed. Okay, that's what we call macroalgae, is seaweed. And so... Um, but I think that's a type of macroalgae. Now, on the manatee grass, it cannot handle being out of the water. So on a low tide, if it's exposed, it's going to die. Um, it cannot handle low salinity. It can't be near the, the mouth of the river. It's got to be out a little farther. And, you know, if you went back to that picture where I showed you where all that seagrass is in the Big Bend area, there's not a lot of river flow in that area. That particular area doesn't have a lot of river flow. And I've got a little piece of video that Ann Rudlow, one of the authors of our book, uh, she's right there. I think Michelle pointed that out to me. But, one of the kids. Yeah. Okay, one of the kids. She is, I've got a little video of her doing um, a search in the seagrass in the St. Joe's Bay, which is up in that area. Uh, and she says there's not a lot of river flow in here, and that's why the salinity levels can stay high. But there still needs to be a certain amount of fresh water flow in there from rainwater or whatever, because when you're in these shallow areas and the hot, the water evaporates off and it would get too salty. So you actually need some uh, fresh water flow into these areas that are shallow so that it doesn't get too salty. But the uh, manatee grass needs.
water it doesn't handle the fresh water well obviously it's got a broad leaf it's got branching roots it stabilizes the sediment um, and I already told you it can't handle the uh, low salinity and so this is just another picture of the turtle grass the reason they named it turtle grass is because sea turtles love to eat this stuff manatees love to eat this stuff too they named the other one manatee grass, I guess, because this already got the name turtle grass. But the turtles love to eat this. It does have the rhizomes and the roots. Um, and so which one, which grass do you think this is now? Look at the pictures manatee in your book. Grass. Very good. This is the manatee grass. Once again, we have a very thin uh, blade on this grass. But the difference in the manatee grass is it's not found where it's shallow. Now, notice that the turtle grass goes from the low tide mark to 10 feet deep basically doesn't go a lot deeper than that it can if the water's really clean and the the sun can really get through the clear water because these are plants they need sunshine to photosynthesize and make food but the manatee grass will go all the way down to 30 feet so it doesn't need as much sunshine to survive and therefore you find it in deeper areas than you find the turtle grass although they will mix it'll usually be found deeper which means now when you're out snorkeling you can kind of almost guess which grass you're looking at by about how deep it is okay and um, the manatee grass will mix with the turtle grass it'll grow up to 30 feet deep it dies if it's exposed to air and uh, it and the shoal weed will break off pretty easily and I don't think you have it here but on the west coast because we don't have the big seabeds seagrass beds here but on the west coast if you go to the beach instead of seeing a bunch of sargasm seaweed like you see over here it's covered in manatee grass pieces. It, it just, when they break off at a certain time of year, it's everywhere in the water, not turtle grass. It's, I think it's the manatee grass because it's real skinny and thin blades. And it may be the shoal weed too, I don't know, because they're, they look very similar to me. How about you? Yeah. I would only be able to determine the difference by where it was depth wise, you know? Uh, I'm serious, yes. Um, we've been to the Keys, and I was just curious. Um, we, it's turtle grass. Right. And in, it's at a hotel, like, so it's in a bay area, and there's these little green blobs. And when you pick them up, they just disintegrate. It's that a type of algae. That's the algae that yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So that one's not the one you're talking about. There's other algae, but that's an algae. And they shouldn't be there. So you shouldn't get in the water? Or oh, no, it? it won't hurt you. It's oh, going to be devastating to the reefs eventually. But uh, I actually asked them at Penny Camp because I found a, it almost looks like a ball, right? It's, it's like almost like a, it's like almost right. like a green. It's not opaque, but it's got like a cloud and stuff. And, and did it look kind of like a, a, a cotton ball-y type yeah, shape. And when you went That's, to pick it up, it just yep, I did that too because I wanted to show the park ranger because it was at one of the uh, reefs in Penny Camp and I'd never noticed it before. And then the last time I went, I noticed them like all over the place. So I picked one up and carried it back into the park and asked them and they said, yeah, we're having this algae problem. And the algae is a problem and it's kind of taking over. And we're going to actually camp on that the last two weeks. We're going to talk about some of the problems that we're seeing and what we can do to fix it and possibly some of the career opportunities that you guys have if you were interested in those kind of things okay so because I know a lot of young people never think about this as career opportunities but it is and as a Christian we need more scientists that are Christians to actually help with the stewardship angle of things so that it's not about saving Mother Earth, you know, but it's about actually being a good steward of what God gave us and just taking good care of it. You know what I'm saying, right? You guys know what I'm talking about when I say saving Mother Earth? Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> just making sure so that you're not looking at me going, what is she talking about? Um, and then the last grass that it mentioned, so that's the manatee grass, that's its rhizome, is Caribbean grass. Now, I had a student on the other coast go, I have never seen that grass. Well, that's because Caribbean grass actually is an understory plant. And so you've got to revert in your brain, what is that talking about? When you're in a forest, remember a forest of trees, the canopy is the top of the trees that closes off the light, basically, if you're in a closed canopy situation. You remember that? Okay. The plants that live under the trees in the forest are called understory plants, like the shrubs, the mosses, the things that live under it. Caribbean grass is actually an understory grass. It will be found under other grasses, but it can actually, because it doesn't need a lot of sunlight, because it's an understory grass, it can grow all the way out to 100 feet deep. Yeah, and it doesn't look like the other grasses really at all, does it? It's not that long, thin blade. It almost looks more like a little plant. 
Um, and there are more types of seagrass in Florida than this. There's actually freshwater seagrass and there's other saltwater seagrasses, but these are the four main ones and that's why we're going over them. I just want you to know that. Um, so this can grow up to 100 feet, can handle dim light. It's an understory plant, so it'll grow beneath the um, turtle grass and beneath the manatee grass, okay? Um, seagrasses actually help to get rid of turbidity. Now that's a word I introduced last week, I think. What was turbidity? Do you guys remember? If something's turbid, what did that mean? Yes? Good. If something's turbid, it, you, you can't see through it very well. The seagrass actually helps pull the turbidity, the particles and stuff, out of the water so that the water is clean because if you don't have clean water, you don't have coral reefs, period. So they're important. What animal did we talk about last week that pulls the, the sediments and stuff out of the estuaries? Do you remember? Helped keep the turbidity down in the estuaries? There was a critter we talked about last week. It's okay. Oysters, good. Oysters, I know you don't think of oysters as doing anything, do you? Yeah, they, people eat them, big deal. They make pearls here and there, big deal, you know, but you don't think of oysters are, as being important. But the oysters actually clean the water and the sea grasses actually clean the water. I gotta go here real quickly. Do you guys know how a pearl is formed in an oyster? You do? Have you ever noticed when you open an oyster, oysters are really, really ugly on the outside, but if you open it and you look on the inside, he's got that pretty, pretty mother of pearl on the inside of the oyster shell. Well, when a piece of sand gets in an oyster, it hurts the oyster and it irritates the oyster because remember, it cleans the turbidity out, but it doesn't want sand like on its body, okay, its soft body. So when it gets in there and it irritates the oyster, the oyster starts coating it with the mother of pearl that's on the inside of the shell that's so pretty, and that's why it makes a pearl. So it makes a pearl by putting a smooth coating over the irritant, and then we take that out as a jewel. And that's a great spiritual picture because God will frequently put things into our lives to make us who we're supposed to be and as we ask the Lord and the Lord helps us to put things over that spiritually the right things over that so that we no longer are constantly irritated by whatever that is God can make pearls in our lives can't he and it really does take the hard things to make pearls in our lives usually so don't want to pass that picture up because it's a really good one. There's a lot of really cool pictures God puts into his creation for us. Um, so the plants clean some of the sediments out. They uh, take in the sunshine and make food for the other animals. Believe it or not, I'm going to show you pictures on one of these videos that they produce oxygen because remember they're photosynthesizing. So you can see the little bubbles coming off the seagrasses as they're producing, no kidding, as they're producing oxygen. And they'll pull nitrogen out of the soil and actually convert the nitrogen into something that other things can use, which is very important because uh, nitrogen is necessary for life, but the nitrogen in the air is not in a state that our bodies can use. So we have to have other things to convert that nitrogen. There's bacteria and stuff in the soil that converts that nitrogen so we can use it. Well, the seagrasses will do that also. And get this, if the book said that in one square inch, so an inch squared of mud, there are 5,000 5, organisms that live in one square inch of mud. But in one square inch of seagrass, you ready for this? There are over 300,000 organisms. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at the seagrass and I go, where? Okay, like, where? But apparently there's all sorts of microscopic life on each leaf of the seagrass. And I'm gonna be in the Keys, not this weekend, but next. And I'm gonna to try to get some pieces of seagrass. Oh, shame on me. I'm gonna to try to cut some pieces of seagrass and bring them in and we'll put them in water and we'll see if we can see some of this life on the leaves. What do you say? Um, but I don't have any with me right now. So we're just gonna to have to do the best we can. And when I looked for it um, on, online, I could not find anything. So the seagrass, the little things that live on the seagrass is a bottom portion of the food web and then the bigger critters eat it and then it grows and grows and grows until the big critters are taken care of. Um, seagrasses once again have a, oh, it's called a hold fast and it's mentioned in your book, hang on. Mm. There, oh, nope, yeah, hold fast, it's on page 91. 
a hold fast is just a structure that seaweed and corals and rocks and things attach themselves. So even a sponge, when it attaches itself to the bottom, it's a hold fast. I don't know about you, but I wish everything was that logical the way they named it. A hold fast, what does it do? It holds it fast. <sighs> you know, so, okay. And then you see uh, on that same page that you have pictures of some macro algaes found in Florida. There's green algae, which that bubblegum shaped green algae is a type of green algae. There's red algae and there's brown algae, which is the sargassum seaweed uh, that we're all familiar with on the beach, right? So um, I took this picture. I don't know how many of you have ever been in the Crosscut Canal that is in Key Largo. Key Largo is a big enough island that the boats were having trouble getting around the island because you had to go so far north or so far south to get around Key Largo. So they cut a canal right through Key Largo. You're familiar with this. Some of you are. And this was taken, and that's why you can see what the key is made of, because they literally cut right through the key. So it's all built on these old reef structures. And what I noticed here, though, is on the side of the Cross Key Canal, and the tide was going out, you have um, red algae, you have green algae, and you have brown algae, all right there. And it's just all bang, bang, bang. And actually, as you go into Blackwater Sound, which is on the inside, not the ocean side, but the inside of that particular cut, um, you see that there, the algae is kind of taking over the seagrass and stuff in that area. And it's, it's really sad because it, 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 there shouldn't be that much. These are natural things, but they're out of balance is the problem. And so um, that's sargassum seaweed. That's the stuff you find on the beach, right? Here on the East Coast. On the West Coast, they don't see a lot of it, although they've seen some of it, so they've told me. Um, how many of you have ever sat around popping the little uh, beads? Yeah, you guys haven't done that? Kind of get rid of your phone and start to live, okay? Um, <laughs> you got to grab the seaweed that's in the water and pop the little beads. I shake it out. Oh, now that's fun. We'll go there in just a second. But you can pop the little beads. Anyway, the little beads are to keep it floating. That's what it's for because this is what it looks like when it grows. And it actually grows like this from the bottom and then it breaks off and that's the part we see. Now it is a blast to take a bucket, put some water in it, shake out the seaweed and you find all sorts of crabs and shrimp and fish, seahorses. That is cool. Um, and so you you can find my kids love to do that when we're at the sandbar and the keys and the, the kids are bored because we're doing our adult thing and just trying to relax the yeah. kids would uh, grab one of the buckets and they'd grab some seaweed after snorkeling around of course um, and then they would shake it out and then they would watch the little fish attack the shrimp and I'm like no 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 you can't do that that's not fair that that shrimp is supposed to have you know that seaweed to hide in so I'd make them turn them loose and then they'd start over because I didn't think that was fair it was like gladiators or something and I'm going no 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 um, and then have you ever been at the beach or someplace and you notice when you're near the seaweed one of the little fish gets confused and thinks you're the seaweed have you had that happen yeah you have a crab. a crab yeah and they come over to you and you're going get away from me and you back up and they follow you you know and you're going no no get away from me and the, and the little critter thinks no you are what I'm hiding in because it associates us with the seaweed. It's very confused, you know? One, yes. A crab went in my hair once. Ooh, that could be bad. Uh, my brother found a crab in seaweed and he let it go in the ocean and then I felt something on my back and the crab was on yep. my hair. And see, he thought your hair was seaweed. He was trying to hide. And they don't mean any harm, freaks us out, but they don't mean any harm, do they? But there's a, a lot of cool stuff in here. And the sargasso seaweed, we're gonna come back to this um, I think, no, not next week, the week after we're going to do sea turtles. I think it's the week after, but when we do sea turtles, we're going to come back to sargasso seaweed because the sargasm, some of you are dolphin fishermen. You know when you're dolphin fishing, mahi-mahi dolphin fishing? When you're looking for dolphin, you're looking for these groups of seaweed out there most of the time. I know that's what my husband looks for because the dolphin like to feed underneath it because there's the small fish in the seaweed and then the dolphin, the mahi, come up and they eat, they eat that small fish and so that's a good place to fish is around these sargasso seaweed areas. But there's seaweed like this, right? Like this off of Isla Morada, which is uh, not very far, like 30 miles south of Key Largo. And when we go by there in the boat, frequently you see dinner plate sized sea turtles feeding on this because when the little turtles hatch 
they go to the Sargasso Sea, which is an area we're going to learn about that's in the Atlantic Ocean where all the sargassum seaweed gets caught and floats around, and the little sea turtles go there to grow. So then when they come back, and the sea turtles in the Isla Morada area find the sargassum seaweed there, they're there feeding in that area, which is really kind of neat. I mean, we've driven by there and you can see at the top, you can see these layers of seaweed that are still attached to the bottom. And, and remember, this is algae. They don't, they're not considered plants. They, they're not structurally like a plant and they don't, yeah, they're not structurally like a plant. And so it's cool to see all these little sea turtles. And we've seen multiple little sea turtles in these particular areas because they like this stuff. So the sargassum seaweed, you guys have had fun with too, shaking stuff out. And let me show you some of the stuff. Can everybody see the little oh, fish I've here? Caught, I've, caught, I've caught a lot of those. Okay, but can you see the little fish? Mm -hmm. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm going to show you some pictures from uh, the Smithsonian Institution, which is very evolutionary. And what the evolutionists will say when they see this, because look at him, he blends right in with the sargasso seaweed, right? And so they go, look at how it adapted to its environment and it's turned to, to its change so that it looks like the sargasso seaweed. And as a scientist, I look at that and I go, how does hanging out in the seaweed change the DNA of that fish so that fish's DNA in its cells knows to look like that? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And the idea that it can mutate to look like what it needs to look like, mutation is mistakes. It's not like you can dial it in and say, okay, I want to look like the seaweed now, next generation, let's do it. You know, it doesn't work that way. And so let me show you some of the cool stuff the Smithsonian has found in the sargasso seaweed. Now this isn't a video, this is a slide presentation. So we're gonna work through this together. Okay, so we got a shrimp there. Oh, come on. There it is, okay. So we've got a shrimp here, come on, come out of there. There's the color. And you can see he looks very much like the sargasso seaweed, doesn't he? So he is designed, yes, he's adapted. Adaptation, you think design when you hear adaptation. His DNA is such that he's designed to live in sargasso seaweed, and that's why he does. That's just a floating piece of sargasso seaweed, but then they're going to show us, look, there's your little crab friend, right? <laughs> There's the little crab. Some of these crabs will actually attach. They look like the seaweed. There's also crabs in there called swimming crabs. That's an adult swimming that's, crab. That's the one that Is that the one? That. Yeah, and they actually swim. And I've been in the boat going by before and seen the crabs swimming. And you're thinking, there's a crab swimming. I've, I've been, I've been you know? in the boat and seen a big blue crab swimming. Swimming by? And then a tarpon come up and just... Oh, no, we don't want to hear that. Okay. <laughs> okay. It had to eat, though. Um, that is a juvenile plain head file fish, which guys, look at how big the, they're called, I think they're pretty, pretty sure they're nematophores, but those little beads, the air beads, you see it? That shows you that fish is probably about, about that big, right? So that gives you kind of a feel for how big it is. Whoops, sorry. Um, this is a nudibroch. Remember the nudibrochs, the sea slugs? Remember? Now, once again, see the beads? That means that nudibroch's probably about that long, right? The one I've seen was about the size of my hand. Wow. It was about that long. Well, it wasn't like that. It was brown. Yes, sir? I was just saying, you used to have a pile of fish in my fish tank. You did? Yes, How big did it get? It's about that right there. Okay, so... Eli, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay, but Eli was telling us that his file fish got about this big in his fish tank. So you had a saltwater tank. That's very cool, very cool. Um, and then, once again, you see how well this thing blends? Did you guys have any seaweed for your file fish to hide in? Uh, he, just, he just adds like the rocks that he eats the seaweed. Okay, okay, okay. So, all right. Um, anyway, so you can see how these guys, okay, can you guys see this little fish? That's a frog fish. Look how big the beads are. The fish has got to be like that long. Very small, right? And this is the kind of thing though that my kids would have fun with because they'd shake them out and then, you know, if nothing else is in there, you can see these little tiny fish and little shrimp and stuff. Then I always made them put them back. But uh, that is what we were looking at at the beginning. And apparently it's a frog fish. I did not know that. Wait. The one that I showed you initially, it's a frogfish. And look, he looks just like the seaweed, doesn't he? It looks kind of like a lime all the time. Ah, you're right. He does a little. Yes. Uh, yes, they actually, um, 
They have a lure on their head. Frogfish? Yeah. Cool. And, and it like attracts fish and it suctions it up. Oh. Uh -huh. And they camouflage and do a bunch of different stuff. You know, we didn't talk about last week, and I'm going to try, I can't go back, I don't know how. Um, <laughs> remember last week we talked about the nudibrachs, mm -hmm. the sea slugs, and they, <laughs> what I forgot to tell you was they'll eat um, jellyfish and man of war and sea anemones and things like that that have stingers, and they literally don't digest the stingers, they keep them and they use them to sting other things. Isn't that a trip? So they're able to actually eat the other critters' stingers, and then they use those stingers. I, I forgot to tell you that last week, and that's so cool I wanted to tell you. So anyway, all right, I think that's it here. Yes, we're back to our little crab or shrimp, so let's go back here. So I think that that is actually a uh, frogfish, and there's the little lure that Garrison's talking about. So that makes sense. It makes sense that they'd call it a frogfish for that reason too. Now once again, this is seaweed and um, it's a type of algae and you notice it is with the turtle grass and there's a lot of it now. But I wanted to tell you where the sand comes from. You know the pretty white sand that we have at the beach and that's in some of these places? There are certain types of algae that actually have a lot of calcium carbonate in their sub, their they're not really leaves, but in their little substance, the little algae. And when it dies, it breaks down and turns into sand. And if you look at it microscopically, it looks like that. Coral, when it dies and it breaks down, will eventually turn into sand. Um, the mollusk, seashells, seashells will break down eventually after it dies and get into smaller pieces and turn into sand. And so do sea urchins. And sea urchins love the seagrass. They eat the algae off of the seagrass. So these things will break down and turn into sand. And then we, we have a slide, but I don't want you to look at it because it's kind of boring. It's not as good as this. And it says foraminifera and ooze. Um, but these are little tiny foraminifera. That's what they look like microscopically. Aren't they pretty? Yeah, I know. Aren't they pretty? And they have these little shells. And so when they die, their shells go into the bottom and it makes the pretty white sand that we think of at the beach or on the bottom. And then some of our sand looks a little more gold because of some of the different components that are in it. But I don't know about you, I always wondered where all that sand came from. Because in places where the sand is black, it comes from the lava rock that's black, like in Hawaii and stuff like that. But our sand isn't that color, and it's, this is where our sand is made. In the Caribbean, we have this pretty white, almost, sand, and this is where it comes from. So I thought you might want to know that. Yes? Um, it's about the algae. I'm pushing it down. Okay. Um, since, like, a lot of the, a lot of algae is bad for the like the yes. environment, yes. would a lot of seaweed be bad for the seaweed? No, um, that's a good question. Emma asks uh, if the algae is bad for the environment, would a lot of seaweed be bad for the environment? I guess if you had too much it could be, <clears throat> but that's not the kind of algae we have problems with because it, it just grows and, you know, the turtles eat it type of thing. The kind of algae we have problems with are the ones that the turtles aren't eating. I remember when we were doing the jellyfish, did I tell you that the jellyfish are out of control? Did I tell this class really? that? I didn't tell this class that. The jellyfish are out of control. It's not just here, it's globally the jellyfish are out of control. I noticed for the last two years in the Keys that there's this increase of the upside down jellies. They're like everywhere. And I'll bring you a picture next week. No, I'll show you right now, hang on. Because upside down jellies are worth seeing what they look like because they're weird. I actually touched the first one I saw because I couldn't figure out what it was and my husband's like, I told you don't eat things and don't touch things, you know. But um, upside down jellyfish. Let's see if we can find one quickly for you. There it is. Okay, they, this is what they look like, all right? And on the bottom, see how they're kind of a greenish brown color? Let's see if I can pull that in for you. Okay, see they're kind of a greenish brown color and it almost looks like a plant. Well, when they sit on the bottom, all you see is this part sticking up so it looks like a plant. And I went down and I'm thinking, that's the strangest plant I've ever seen. So I'm going, what the heck is that? You know, and I touched it and then it turned over and went, <laughs> my husband's like, stop touching things, you know? And so I noticed, no, I just touch things, I'm bad. Um, and yes, it does have tentacles with stingers. And the reason, I didn't think it was a jellyfish, hang on just a second, I didn't think it was a jellyfish because it had so much color, right? 
I mean, I know some jellies, the moon jellies can have like a pinky color, but this you can't see through. It's got so much color. Well, it's got a symbiotic relationship, which we're going to learn about in the next one when we talk about coral. Like coral, it's got algae that lives in its tissues that helps it survive. So that's why it's got such a greenish brown color. And it's called an upside down jelly because it'll just sit on the bottom like that until it does this. Well, I noticed over the last couple years, there's been a whole lot more of them to the extent that they're at the sandbar, that they're everywhere. And they do sting you because I've been stung by them sitting on them. Did Didn't expect it on the bottom. Okay, and sat down on the sand and it's there where it doesn't belong. Well, as I started, and then I noticed that the moon jellies a couple years ago, they were coming in too early. They used to come in in October to where you really didn't want to get back in the water because the moon jellies were all over the reef. But then all of a sudden they were there in August a couple years ago, which really hurt a lot of the business in the Keys because people didn't want to get go snorkeling in all the moon jellies. You'd get hit by all the tentacles and stuff. Well, then when I did a little research on it this year, I saw that globally jellyfish are on the rise to where they're stopping up nuclear power plant cooling systems and that they are really becoming a problem. Now we have to ask, and I asked this immediately when I saw that the jellies were on the rise, I said, what have we taken out of the environment that used to eat these things? You know what I'm saying? Because there's got to be some predator that used to keep these things under control, and now we've removed whatever it was that ate these jellies, and these jellies are just reproducing like crazy. And now the moon jellies come in on a regular basis earlier because they're, they're, just, they're shifting, and it's not good because it makes it so we can't get in the water as easily. So uh, the jellyfish are a problem right now, like the algae is. It's something natural that's out of balance because we've changed something in the system. We're going to do coral reefs next week, and we'll talk more about when you take one thing out of the system, how it changes everything. Um, Caleb, did you have something, sweetie? I was just going to say there's a lot of those upside down jellyfish in the Keys. Absolutely. That's where I've seen them. I don't think I've seen them up here, but in the Keys, there's a lot of them. Do yes, sir. Turtles eat jellyfish? Yes, I, de I definitely think turtles eat jellyfish. I they're think actually, you're right. I think they're actually immune to being stung. Uh, the, the turtles can eat the jellyfish without having a problem. That's true. So, I don't know about immune, but they can handle it. So, um, all right. Okay, let's do this one. So, while we're here, I've got a couple little pieces because I can't take you to the seagrass beds. So, I'm going to do the best thing I can, which is take you there in video form. So, let's try that. Let's see if we can get some sound going on. Seagrass are an important part She of talks fast. Do your best to follow though, because she's good. She's got good stuff. Like plants on land, seagrass need sunlight to make energy for growth. There are many different species of seagrass, and most species are adapted to live in sunny, clear, shallow water. Seagrass are a part of the base of marine food web. Without the presence of seagrass, many species would disappear. Seagrass takes nutrients from the water, which are in turn consumed by animals like manatees and sea turtles. Seagrass beds are used by grouper, snapper, and shrimp as a nursery for their young, and they stabilize the shoreline and improve water clarity by absorbing nutrients and capturing sediments. Seagrass photosynthesize, which yeah, do you see the bubbles? Available in the water for other sea life. Seagrass thrives in water that is clear and receives a lot of sunlight. Unfortunately. Poor water quality leads to cloudy water and decreases seagrass abundance. Freshwater releases from Lake Okeechobee and the Caloosahatchee watershed have dramatically decreased water quality. Caloosahatchee is, is what comes off Lake Okeechobee on the west coast. Freshwater discharges from the lake and watershed are extremely polluted by nutrients that come from agricultural fields and dairy farms. When releases are high, blooms of phytoplankton and mackerel can occur. Although they are a natural part of the ecosystem, they can cause a chain reaction of negative effects when things are out of balance. Large amounts of phytoplankton and macroalgae can block out sunlight that is essential for seagrass survival. Freshwater releases during the summer wet season often cause salinities to go below the level necessary for survival in many seagrass, and at the same time, increases the nutrient load, which promotes blooms of sunlight blocking the Remember we looked at that, the blue-green algae bloom? Stores to support agriculture around the lake, and freshwater releases become too infrequent, and salinity levels in the Pusahatchee River increase. That happened over here, into the St. Lucie Lagoon. So it's happening on both coasts. 
Scientists and policymakers are working to restore tape grass in the Clusahatchee River because it is a good indicator species for the success of That's a freshwater seagrass. Water quality okay. is the only problem for seagrass. Seagrass habitats are often destroyed by boat crops. In shallow water, the spinning propeller gashes into the root system and creates deep cuts through the seagrass bed. It can take up to 10 years for crop scars to recover, which is why it is important to vote responsibly by pulling through designated areas and by avoiding shallow seagrass beds. Seagrass creates a beautiful ecosystem we can all enjoy. The oceans and estuaries are full of life, which is supported by seagrass and other aquatic vegetation. Many threats caused by man-made changes to our environment threaten our way of life in southwest Florida by degrading our water quality and threatening the long-term survival of seagrass beds from the headwaters of the Caloosahatchee River to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. I think she did a really nice job. Now, one of the things she mentioned there was scars. Let's go back, grab the next one. Oh, we're going to do a couple of these. No, you're fine. I so appreciate your help. Never apologize for helping. I appreciate you. Just know that. This one's also from Southwest Florida, because once again, you don't have the seagrass beds over here. Seagrass beds are very important places in estuaries. They this is only a minute by long. Holding the substrate in place and provide a vital nursery habitat. Most of the fishes begin their lives in these sea grasses. Now, I want you to catch what he just said. They decrease turbidity because they actually, remember, turbidity is that sediments in the water, because they actually hold the sediments down on the bottom. That's cool, right? So the oysters actually suck it out of the water, but these guys actually hold the bottom down so that it doesn't kick up as fast. The other thing the other one mentioned was the uh, scars. This guy's gonna talk about it too, and then we'll talk about it for a minute. And so they're critically important. The things to know when, when operating in seagrass beds, uh, be aware of the, the water depth, traverse the seagrass bed at, at a low speed so as, so as not to cause prop scarring. The prop scar is, is when a, Can you a, see a it? propeller is through here? and it goes This is from the, the up in the sky, okay? It digs down into the substrate. It, it physically chops it, up. It the, destroys the, the, the seagrass bed. The seagrasses. And this is very damaging because uh, there have been surveys done after the fact to show that these, this, this damage can perpetuate for years on end. And not only that, it can sort of lead to a snowballing effect where the grass is... You is see how wide it is? That started as a prop scar. And, and some areas where you have multiple instances of prop scarring, the seagrass is going to be negatively impacted such that their growth may, be, um, may not be as luxurious as it would be otherwise. I just want you to see, this is more what it looks like on the west coast may not be as luxurious. Wow, as look at that. I got words. You world. see there's a lot of grass because it's a, a low energy shoreline and it's got the mangrove trees and stuff and that's why the seagrass beds are there. See? Yes, and we do have a lot of rays on our coast. The students know that. Go ahead and turn on the light for me for just a minute, please, and then we'll come back. I was fishing in Jupiter, in Jupiter Inlet, mm -hmm. and I saw a big, big, big spotted ray just came right up to the shore. Very cool. All right, we'll do a couple of these guys, and then we're going to go back and watch some more. If you will turn to... Uh, page 93, 92 and 93, it talks about some of the things that live in the seagrass beds. One of the things it mentioned were polychaete flatworms, and these are actually, this is underwater, and these are worms, believe it or not, okay? And some of the polychaete worms can be very, very pretty. They can get real fuzzy and real colorful. Um, a lot of crustaceans live in the seagrass beds. A lot of small ones and large ones live in there. And then when I looked at life in the seagrass beds, I had all sorts of cool things it's a squid. Uh, it might even be a cuttlefish. I'm not sure. It, it looks more like a cuttlefish, yes. But uh, and, yeah, really. Anyway, they live in the seagrass beds. A lot of different fish uh, start in the seagrass beds, in, including certain types of grouper and stuff. They start as the babies in the seagrass beds, and then some of them stay there. You already mentioned that you might find a um, seahorse. And they used to be very prevalent in the seagrass. Uh, when I was a kid, 
I remember we'd go on the boat and when you're going through an area that you had to go slowly, the seaweed and seagrass parts that were floating on the top, I'd find seahorses right there in them. Right there as we rode by in the boat, I'd be collecting seahorses because they were so prevalent at that time. So uh, it's not like that anymore. You guys know that seahorses, the daddy carries the babies until they're born, right? That the, the mama puts the eggs into the daddy and it's got a, a place on his stomach here that the eggs stay until they grow and they hatch and then daddy has to birth the babies and then he's exhausted after. I've actually got a picture of it if, if we can, uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll watch that. Does anybody know what that is? They, they're not at this side of the earth. It's a sea dragon. It's a very fancy type of seahorse, isn't it? That is one fancy seahorse. And if you go to SeaWorld, they have some, and they're about that long. They're big. And they live in like Australia and New Zealand and places like that. And they look just like the seaweed where they live. So you can see how that would blend in nicely with seaweed, can't you? Um, so anyway, that's a sea dragon. Um, this is some more stuff that you would find in the seagrass beds, which would be rays and skates. Rays have the skinnier tail. Skates are the ones with the shorter, stubbier tails. Um, on our coast, on the west coast, you literally have signs at the beach that say, shuffle your feet, okay? Because we have so many rays at the beach that you have to shuffle your feet because they, they won't hurt you as long as you kick them, they'll just move. But if you step on one, they'll sting you because they want you off of them. And so, and I've seen the ambulance at the beach several times because kids stepped on rays. So you have to shuffle your feet if you ever go to the West Coast because you can't see your feet. I told you that. You get in, you can't see anything. So it, it's, it, to me, it's, yeah, well, you guys are spoiled over here. You don't realize how spoiled you are, so you have to be careful. There's about two days a year that you can see the bottom that I've seen over there. And when I can see the bottom over there, I'm like, oh, look, <laughs> because, yeah, it's just so strange. This is a bango shark. Can you see the critter here? That's a bango shark. Now, it's from Parks, Victoria, which says to me it's from like Australia or New Zealand or someplace like that. It looks like a, actually a skate, more of a skate than a ray because you see how fleshy the tail is? That's one of the real easy, easy ways to determine between a skate and a ray. But you're right, but it could be a shark. We just, you know, you'd have to get a better look on it. A ray head. And there's other uh, fish that look like that too. And sharks and rays are classified together. Now, in evolution, to tell you they evolved one from the other. I don't think so, but they do have similarities, so they should be classified together because their, their um, gills are open, whereas a fish's gills are covered by an operculum. They actually have a covering over them. And uh, sharks, you can see their gill slits. And rays, you can see their gill slits. They have the same number of gill slits. They have certain things that are similar. Um, they're cartilaginous. They don't have bones. Uh, uh, fish actually have a bony skull and a bony skeleton as far as the spine, at least. But these these guys, it's cartilage, this stuff that bends, it's not bone. And so um, they're different and, and therefore they should be classified with their similarities and their differences. Yes, sir? Um, stingray and rays and stuff, mm -hmm. um, they actually eat crabs because their mouths on the right. side of them. Right. They'll come down Actually, we'll them. study those. We'll come up there and we'll study those yet. Yeah, you're right. They're interesting. Who knows what that is? Who knows? Oh. How did you know? You see the one in the book, right? Good job. Okay, that is a scallop. Now, do you see all the little beads here, girls? <laughs> Pointing out to the girls. <gasps> Those are eyes. <laughs> I know. Look how many eyes it's got. It's got all sorts of eyes. And I used to eat scallops until I saw a video on one running from somebody that was trying to catch it to eat it. And literally this thing was going root, 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 trying to run from the guy that was chasing it. And I thought, okay, I don't need to eat anything that tries to survive that hard. It just freaked me out, you know, that this scallop, you know, because I think of clams and I'm like, okay, you grab a clam, you eat it, no big deal. You grab an oyster, you eat it, no big deal, right? But the scallop is like running for its life. And I'm going, oh, you know, so... I felt that way about a grouper once. My, my husband went down to spearfish a grouper, and he's using my dad's old gear, and the gear's falling apart. 
So my husband's like, well, let it go. I go, well, you can't. You shot it now. You can't just leave it down there. It's going to die. It's wounded. He says, so now you got to get it. Well, it took him like seven tries because my dad's equipment kept fa failing. By the time my husband finally got that grouper in the boat, when they cooked it, I said, I'm not eating him. I, I feel attached to him. I've been watching him, you know, die slowly. It's just, I I'm weird. I could be a vegetarian really easily. I just want you to know that. So I don't. I don't go after scallops anymore after I saw one run for its life. It just freaked me out a little. There you see the turtle munching out on this turtle grass, okay? So they actually do like uh, the grass. This is what I see when I go into the seagrass. And so I wanted to show it to you. It's not in your book. Can you guys see what that is? Is that a stingray? I'll show you the next picture. Whoa. <gasps> it's a conch. And that's what they look like in the seagrass. And they graze in the seagrass, and that's where they live. And that's where you find conch is in the, on the bottom in the seagrass. And that's what he looks like. But he's very much alive, and when you turn him over, he looks like that. See the little fish in the conch? OK, see him hiding there? And this is why I don't flip them over, because I don't want to disturb them. But I will swim down next to them. There is his eyes. And they will come out the side of the conch shell. And if if you snorkel down and you go to next to a live one in the seagrass, he'll stick his little eyes out and look at you like, what are you doing? I just think they're so cool. So, and then they have, you know, like a pad-like foot that they push with. And actually, that's what people eat, is that muscle that makes up that foot that they push with. And when they, you eat conch chowder or whatever, that's what you're eating is that muscle. But uh, they're very cool little mollusks, mollusks being soft body critters that usually have a shell. And I just like conchs. I think they're cool. So anyway, so they're in the sea grasses also. Then your book goes on, and we go into the, oh, I don't want to go on yet. Look on page 93, please. Yes, Garrison. Um, it was also talking about the turtle, and it called it a um, sea buffalo. Sea buffalo. The, the turtle grass is named for the turtle because they eat so much grass. And then the, the manatee used to be called the sea cow when I was a kid because they eat so much grass also. So that's the similarity. In your book, look on the top of page 93, you have staghorn coral. Notice it looks like a, a deer's horn. That's where it gets the name. Because I had some students ask about the lettuce coral. Lettuce coral looks like lettuce, the shape. That's why it's named that. Staghorn coral looks like staghorns. That's why it's named that. Uh, Elkhorn coral looks like elk horns. That's what's named that. You see what I'm saying? So that's that's how people named it. At least that's logical. I still kind of can't figure out how people got to, got away with naming the birds what they did, but we won't go there. Um, okay, then to the right of it is the reticulated, yeah, reticulated brittle star. That's a starfish. They have these on the West Coast. You can go to the beach in Fort Myers and see these. That's a starfish where his legs move almost like have you seen them? Their legs move like a spider. Yeah, they move like a spider. And so, well, they're, but they're starfish. And, and notice it says here when it captures, um, okay, it's not dangerous. And they can be little bitty. They can get about this big. They're just starfish, and they just move. Unlike a regular starfish who's little, uh, will you do me a favor? Um, in the microscope cabinet, left-hand side kind of low, there is a starfish in a plastic bag, please. Thank you. Um, you know how the starfish have a suction, suction cups on the bottom of their, uh, their, that's how they move, the tube feet, the suction cups? Well, how a starfish eats, including the brittle star, is he grabs a clam and he pulls it open slightly, and then he takes his stomach and inverts his stomach, turns it inside out, inverts it, and sticks his inside out stomach into the clam. He puts digestive fluids on it and digests the clam, and then he absorbs it, and then he pulls his stomach back into his body. That's a pretty cool Thank word. you very much. And so that's how a starfish actually eats. Now, this is not a reticulated brittle star, but this is a regular starfish. It's, it's actually dead because it's too, uh, to dissect. But I want you, we'll go ahead and just, I'll give it to you to pass around. You can look, take a look at the uh, tube feet on it, OK? I'm going to start with the ladies. So ladies first. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you use the microscope? I don't know if we're going to get that far, so we'll see. OK, the next thing over is the nudibroch. So see that, uh, I know it looks like nudibranch, but I've read before that it's pronounced nudibroch. So that's, we're going to call it a nudibroch, okay? Yes, Eli? You do? Okay, but you don't have a, what do you, how do you feed it? Uh, you just eat whatever's in the rocks. Okay, okay. All right, but they do like clams. Uh, there's another nudibroch at the very bottom. You see the scallop there? 
And the C squirt, guys, everybody see the C squirt on the left hand side of the picture, the second thing down? I want you to notice here that it says this animal appears not at all to be like a close relative of ours, but in its early development, it's similar to the development of vertebrate embryos, and then it's classified as a chordate. In other words, they're trying to tell you we're related to C squirts. I don't know about you, but I am not related to a C squirt, okay? <laughs> now, there are some similarities in its developmental stage, but it has nothing to do with us because we didn't evolve. So once again, I just, and when you're in biology, you're going to learn more about sea squirts and what they're talking about there. Then we get to the shrimp. And it talks about the pink shrimp. And these are Key West pink shrimp. And they have a pretty interesting story. Um, the shrimps go and spawn in this, I'm going to come back to this picture. But they spawn down here at the dry tortugas. So it's about 70 miles off the coast of Key West. You cannot get there by car. You have to go by boat or plane if you want to go to the dry tortugas. Okay, people go there for fishing and uh, snor snorkeling and things like that. Um, but that's where the shrimp go to spawn. It says spawn being laying their eggs, okay? Um, they spawn in the spring, and if I remember correctly, let me just get this. Each one spawns, oh, here we go. 4.3 million shrimp will make their way to spawn there. Get that, okay? And they'll spawn, let's see, it's spawning. Each female can release 300,000 to a million eggs at a time. Wow. You would think we'd be overrun with shrimp, right? Let me keep going. So when the shrimp hatch, they start almost too small to see. And it takes them, uh, within the first day, they go through five changes. So in the first day, they go through five molts. That means shedding their skin, okay, their, their outside coat, shedding their exoskeleton, five molts. And they're still really too small to see. They're like an eighth of an inch big. And then they'll continue to feed on plankton and stuff for three weeks. They get to an eighth of an inch, okay. And then um, they will start floating in the current because they can't swim against the current. And they'll continue to grow. And it says 20% of the population is lost to predators. That means, and predators being jellyfish and things that can grab a little tiny shrimp that looks so small you really can't see and they say it looks like snow in the water. All right? So that means one out of every five dies each day during this period of time. Okay? One out of every five dies each day during this period of time. Then it says they'll float across the ocean coming back towards the grass beds. And that's why we're talking about this because they actually do part of their life cycle in the grass beds that we are looking at. And it says that on their way floating back to the grass beds, out of every 10,000 shrimp, out of every 10,000 shrimp that hatched, 9,999 will die before they ever get to the grass beds. <laughs> That means one in every 10,000 makes it to the grass bed. Now you see why she has to have 300,000 uh, to a million every time she has eggs? Because with this rate of loss, there's going to be no shrimp, right? And so, so <laughs> she has to have a whole bunch. So finally, these little tiny shrimp get back to the grass beds. And if you'll turn in your book to page... The page I can't get to, page 94. Yep, page 94. It shows you that the shrimp go back across um, to the grass beds there in southwest Florida and in the Appalachian area up there, higher up. They get up there and they actually dig into the mud in the daytime and then come out and feed at night. And that's why people will go shrimping at night. They will go over the grass beds with lights in their boat, and the shrimp come to the light, and they will scoop them up in nets. I remember that as a kid. People used to do that. My dad used to do that. Anyway, so they will go uh, shrimping. They will grow during the fall, well, during the fall and the winter when the waters get cold, they go where the water's deeper, go a little deeper into the water that's more stable temperatures. And then by the spring, they're up to the, the following spring, takes them about a year, they get up to the seven inch mark, they get big again, and they head back for the dry tortugas. That's the adult, they head back for the dry tortugas and they uh, spawn again. So that's their life cycle. And so they use the seagrass beds as part of their life cycle. So they go into all these area, into the seagrass beds as a, a part of it. We already talked about the turtle being the sea buffalo, the manatee being the sea cow. It talked about some of the... Uh, oh, way back here, yep. Okay. Um, that is a... 
Harry blonde. Blonde, blonde hair, hair. E blacky, black is the egret, blonde is the heron, right? Blacky and blonde hair, right? Blacky and blonde hair. So here is your uh, blacky egret, and here is your heron. I'll get that eventually. Um, it talked about cormorants being in there, and immediately the kids on the other coast said, wait, it's an anhinga. The difference is an anhinga has a pointy beak, and the cormorant has the C at the end of its beak, like its name, cormorant. That's how I tell the difference. And then my daughter pointed out to me, she only sees cormorants in the salt water, and she only sees anhinga in the fresh water, and I think she's right. As I've started to look at that, I've seen that she is right. We are one of the few places in the world where we have both anhingas and cormorants. They look the same because they stand out there like this, and they dry their, you know, because they don't have the oil, so they're drying themselves after they fish. They fish differently because the anhinga, which is the fresh water one actually spears the fish that it eats on its pointy bill and then comes up, throws it up, and swallows it, whereas the cormorant will grab the fish kind of, it swims after it, but it'll grab the fish and then it doesn't spear it because it doesn't have that kind of a beak. So uh, you know what that is. What's that? Osprey. Very good. A water eagle. And we all know what that is. Uh, bald eagles do like to fish, so we, would, we do have them in the they Keys in different other, places. They actually fight each other and steal fish from each other. Oh yeah, I There's think most fish. And head. then pelicans are good fishers and they, they depend on the salt marshes. Now I want to show you this one with Ann Rudlow before we leave each other because it's a part of Florida that most of you guys will never see. And she does a really good job. And I think what she's doing is just taking students right off the beach. These are not people she brought with her. I think she's, she's kind of, I, I can relate, because I'd walk up and go, you want to do something cool? Let's do this, you know. And I think that's what she did here, because um, the students are like, oh, we were so lucky we were here today, and we got to do this, you know. And so take a listen. This lady is now with, well, this lady has passed. She has died. And she was one, of, I think she was the first woman to ever use the big dive gear to go deep diving. She was like a pioneer in the oceanographic world as a woman. That's her husband. This is a predatory snail. It eats other mollusks. And it in turn is eaten by some of the larger snails out here, like the left-handed whelk and the horse pond. I wasn't aware of how diverse this environment actually is compared to uh, a coral reef. And it's uh, kind of odd how the word diversity is. It also seems incredibly fragile, the environment is as well. Actually, the environment is very resilient. It can bounce back because God made it tough. We just have to not abuse it. So this is upstate in the Big Bend. It's exciting. We, I don't know. I kind of get first with the sea urchins, but the more you get comfortable with it. Have you guys ever seen one of those? On my coast, you have to watch out not to step on them. They're everywhere over there. Uh, no, it was a sea urchin. Oh, right then, yes, it was a scallop. Okay, so they're on shoal grass. So they're closer to the shore. And hopefully whatever small organisms are in a seagrass bed that you don't see snorkeling. And there might be grass shrimp. There might be several species of what are called Caribbean shrimp. There might be mice and shrimp in here. There might be small little snails. Only a professor in oceanography would know all the different types of shrimp. <laughs> the rest of us would go, oh look, shrimp. <laughs> but she knows all of them and their Latin names. That tells me she is a professor. There is a live sea urchin. That's what they look like, live. It's its mouth. Did you see it at the top? That was its mouth. I don't think so. And then out beyond that, even further out, where you can just barely see the streaks of the sandbars, is turtle grass. And when you go out into that water, it's only about waist deep, it's warm, you can snorkel around. You, if you get upset about something, you can stand up and walk home. It's very simple to do logistically. And it's clear water, so what you have here are rooted flowering plants on the seafloor. And those rooted flowering plants are just chock full of marine animals. That's caught, the truth. Uh, Lots and lots of shrimp, lots and lots of clams, snails, 
sea squirts, tunicates, starfish, sea urchins. It's just like an underwater garden of marine life. There are not many places you could so easily go to and just see the huge diversity of marine life that's really out there. It's called flat clawed hermit crab. This looks like this is one of my favorite places to bring students. We were really lucky to have some students here today. And typically when you take Doesn't that sound like she just picked them up? Snorkel around for an hour or so. And they just, it's a life-changing experience for them because nobody has seen that kind of stuff so easily before or so many things that are completely different from anything they'd ever seen before outside of an aquarium. So here you get to see it in its natural environment. And it's beautiful, too. The, the sunlight, Look at that. The water, Is that cool? Pufferfish? And he's going, let me go! Look at the look at the little crab. I think so. I don't know the different types of crabs. Seagrass bed is sometimes that would freak me out personally. Where the water is lower in salinity and sometimes found in higher salinity environments. See, St. Joe Bay is one of the few bays in the North Florida area that's not estuarine because it doesn't have big rivers. That's a person. So the salinity stays high and it's stable. The water stays clearer, and that's where. But did you hear what she's saying? She's saying they don't have the influx of fresh water like other estuaries, but you still have to have some fresh water because it'll get too salty from evaporation. And then a lot of animals can't live here. So it's also a nursery habitat, just like a oh, this salt is good. marsh. It is the place where you find the juveniles. The juveniles of the pig shrimp are here. When they grow up and they that we just talked about the waters, that's where they're caught. But the little guys, they're about this big, this big, this big. They're out here in the seagrass bed. So just like a salt marsh, in an asteroid, Look! Is nursery you see the little tiny it's also starfish? For gag grouper. If now listen. you go offshore fishing for gag grouper, your gag grouper started off as a little fish about this big in here that was bright green so that it would blend in with the blades of seagrass. Cool. So they use that oh. What's that? Protect itself like it's doing here. Uh, horseshoe crab! Horseshoe crab! You guys, we don't have those on this coast. They're on the other coast. Sea urchins, horse crabs. Have you seen them on this coast? Cool. Now watch him flip himself. Watch. Now watch. You see how it's using the tail? I know, that's a big one. And there he goes. Looks like something from a dinosaur. That's what they want us to believe. All right. We have to go. I'll tell you what. We will finish up this discussion next week, okay? All right, you guys. Have a good week.